Welcome, everyone. Nice to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I thought I would start out uh, with a little poetic definition of the now from one that you may have heard from one of uh, our favorite poets, William Blake. So here's a definition poetically of the now. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And that's it. Thanks for. <laughs> so, would you like to it is, begin? It is a beautiful. It's one. <clears throat> it's one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes. Uh -huh. And what I like about it is that William Blake, uh, and this is actually not rehearsed. We are just we just met a few minutes ago. <laughs> I was surprised that you brought this up. <laughs> but William, the reason that William Blake wrote poems like this is that he lived about 100 years after uh, Newton had made his uh, clockwork like mechanistic mm -hmm. model in theoretical physics, in mathematics, mm -hmm. in which everything seemed to be perfectly explained as a clockwork mm -hmm. in this mathematical formula. And William Blake in England and um, Goethe in Germany both revolted against that. They hated that, and they wanted science to be different. Mm. But fortunately, scientists did not listen to them. They just went on with their science, and by their own light, a hundred years later, <laughs> they stumbled on quantum mechanics, mm. which unfortunately, Blake and Goethe didn't live long enough to uh, see, since they would have really loved it. <laughs> it brought back the magic in the yes. understanding of matter and nature. Beautiful, yes, yeah, so that, uh so just getting a feel for it, I know that as we talk, we're going to get a little intellectual and a little, you know, just bringing uh, science and uh, different uh, uh, kind of new terms and definitions from Tibetan Buddhism, but really try to get a feel for what the now is as we begin to define it, as we begin to offer, just as William Blake did, kind of a shift into experientially uh, knowing the now, which is more felt than intellectually known. It's a, it's a direct experience uh, from the Tibetan Buddhist point of view. And uh, I'll talk a little about maybe uh, some simple definitions um, just to clarify what often is talked about as the present moment, the present, and the now. So, you, you know, we hear as we're trying to be helped by a lot of um, <clears throat> spiritual, meditative, contemplative wisdom traditions, you know, be in the present moment, or uh, just be more present, or, you know, get out of the past and get out of the future and be more present. But actually the definition in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, for the now <clears throat> is the timeless awareness that includes the past, present, and future. So it's that awareness that treats past, present, and future as equal relative times. And there are uh, kind of traps in getting too caught in the past and too caught in the future but also too caught in the present. So in terms of the present time, yeah? So um, one of the teachers of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Gampopa said, don't invite the future, don't pursue the past, let go of the present, relax right now. So starting to get a feel of that difference, uh, and I'll talk more about kind of the, the ways that we get trapped in each one, but just then to define the present moment, which we often hear 
And I believe that a lot of the people who say that and are actually just using the term present moment the way I'm using the term now. So it's not like anybody who uses present, be in the present moment. They often mean the same thing I'm <laughs> calling the now. So, but one of the things you learn when you start to meditate is actually that the way that you aren't so solid and so uh, <clears throat> caught in this identification with everything and in this small sense of self is when you start to meditate, you start to notice that actually thoughts, feelings, and sensations are passing moment to moment. So a moment in time is like this. Gone, 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 gone. So there's almost no way that you can actually be in the present moment. <laughs> It's like, it's like sitting at a riverbank, right? And you look at one area where the water is going over the rock. And if you try to be in that moment, is it, the, the river's gone down already, so it's a new moment. There's new water. It may look the same, but it's actually new water going by, yeah? And interestingly, like if you look at the way we perceive, <clears throat> in terms of those who know about film or that there's 24 frames per second of still moments that when you link them together at exactly that speed, it seems like somebody's like this. If it's too fast, too many frames, they look like this. If it's too few frames, it's, it's slow motion. But our mind is taking these moments and experiencing them as a flow of moment to moment experience and then we're aware from, from this timeless awareness, which is both spacious and pervasive, which is inherent and connected, but is open, not looking from a kind of point of view, using attention, but literally dropped and opened and inclusive and spacious and all at once. And from there, we can be in the now, remembering the past, deciding what we're going to do, writing a shopping list for the future, <laughs> and then we can deal with the past, remembering what we need to go shopping for, writing it in the present, and deciding when we're going to go for the future, right? So you can have past, present, and future, and there's no problem with past, present, or future if you're not caught in one. So we'll explore a little bit more about um, what it means to be in the now and how we kind of get caught in these three times and get kind of fixated or small or enmeshed or uh, obsessed or trapped in time. Clock time, psychological time. Yeah? What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, if I didn't know anything about Tibetan Buddhism, I, th I would be really surprised. But <laughs> for a very long time, I've been studying science professionally and various forms of contemplative traditions, uh, actually from the, the end of high school, really, uh, as a very serious hobby. And it has always struck me that there are so many parallels between science and between contemplation. <clears throat> Not so much between science and religion, because much of what is called religion is dogmatic, it's political, it's a power play, and much of it is very serious and very personal. So the very serious, experiential, personal part, uh, <clears throat> you can say spirituality, you can say contemplation, let me use that word. In both cases, uh, in science as well as in contemplation, the real trick is a suspension of judgment. If you suspend your judgment, then you can be open to discover new ideas, new things, new aspects. Uh, it means uh, not believing and not disbelieving. So no superstition, but also no deadening skepticism. Uh, superstition and, and strong skepticism are equally closing doors. 
So the challenge is to just uh, try to be open and in both cases, in science as well as in contemplation, uh, what leads to new insight is not a new idea. Uh, new ideas are great, and especially in art uh, and in many art literature, fashion, design, new ideas are wonderful. But in science and contemplation, the idea is to see what are the old ideas that hold you back. So try to see which ideas are, are uh, blocking progress. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, it is not an addition of ideas, but it is a subtraction. Mm -hmm. Would that make sense? Mm. Yes, absolutely, you? yeah. Mm -hmm. That there's a conditioned mind. Yeah. The conditioning is creating relative functioning, mm -hmm. but is also blocking um, <clears throat> the creative mind, mm -hmm. the naturally uh, awake, uh, spontaneous, uh, mind that's bigger than mm -hmm. just the information. Yeah. yeah. As an example, uh, <clears throat> the beginning of modern astronomy with Copernicus, uh, who came up with the notion that maybe the sun is in the center and the earth goes around the sun. Uh, it was not the case that in the time of Copernicus, people were wondering, well, in the morning, is the sun rising or is the earth uh, setting? Uh, once you ask that question, well, then you know you have two possibilities. Uh, before Copernicus, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, it was so obvious that the, Earth is, that the sun is rising, so uh, you don't ask the question, is that really true or not? But once you start asking the question, then you have a possibility for a new mm -hmm. opening. And it feels very similar to me in your line of business. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, the, you know, the, the, um, amazing thing about this um, <clears throat> kind of contemplative science is there's so much wisdom now that's available both from uh, texts that have been translated from around the world and meetings of minds from many cultures. All the wisdom traditions are, are being met and understood and being dialogued from empiricism, meaning what's true, what works, which part is uh, cultural, religious belief, and which part is uh, what I call part of the human lineage, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the human consciousness, which is the part that we can definitely agree on uh, is what is reported by these wise gals and wise guys, which mm -hmm. is basically that there's a well-being, there's a sense of compassion that's natural and it's already installed in us. It's available, it's who we are, it's equally the same in all of us, but as you say, it's covered over by not only ideas and beliefs, but literally patterns of organizing identity and safety. And those patterns, we just keep reorienting because that's what we know, because that's what the culture is supporting, mm -hmm. and so, even when people have glimpses of this amazing freedom and joy and embodied uh, community, uh, you know, they leave a retreat and a day later they're back and snap. They're back in, you know, I'm sure a number of you have had that experience. <laughs> You're back in the old way and you kind of remember, oh yeah, remember that? You know, whether it's I went on that retreat or I climbed that hill in that beautiful part of nature and when I got there with my friends, we felt such joy that we had accomplished something and then we let go of the striving and we looked out over the vista. We felt this vastness and we felt, looked at each other and smiled and just felt this sense of complete joy and and connection and well-being to everything and our creative mind started working and now two days later oh when is my next vacation so I can go back to that place because that's where it is and so the question is is that where it is or is it is that natural condition which was brought on by conditions of which helped to support it can that be accessed now because it is natural? And that's the kind of pioneer or revolutionary possibility 
that groups of people now are starting to support each other to kind of continue to wake up and continue to grow up. And my thesis is actually that awakening is the next natural stage of adult human development. And that that is absolutely capable, but there's so much um, resistance within us that the strong, sometimes the strongest uh, ego development that l led us to be able to consider that is, is what's preventing us from going beyond it. Because it's kind of got so comfortable and so protective. And there's got to be a kind of letting go, but once you let go into this uh, now that's aware and embodied and interconnected, in which thought then becomes more of a tool, it's a, it's a whole new, it's like the, the, the difference between, it's like the Comper, Compernia, Compernia, Copernicus Copernican? Revolution, <laughs> Copernican Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it is very interesting that um, in Europe, as much as in um, Asia and other continents, uh, this sense of, of living presence, mm. this sense of really being, being in the now, the way mm. you said, uh, was always present in, uh, in, in the traditions for those people who were interested to, uh, to explore that. But uh, somehow between Copernicus and Galileo mm. around that time, uh, changes in Europe uh, happened which put uh, the really lived contemplative experiential part of Christianity uh, in the background. And I think it was a confluence of um, Protestantism, protesting uh, with good reason against many of the excesses of uh, and the corruption in the Catholic Church at that time, um, trying to go back and really make it simple, but then also throwing the baby with the, out with the bathwater bath and really focusing on the spoken word, on the mm. concepts, and mm -hmm. often leaving out the, the lived ritual supported reality. And then with the, um, with the um, uh, Reformation came the Contra-Reformation within the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, etc., mm -hmm. who wanted to compete with them and also show that they could be rational and, and be better than the excesses of the past. And in that climate, uh, science uh, grew mm -hmm. and science and humanism often based on, uh, on intellectual, uh, rational mm -hmm. part of our uh, mind. And all of those together basically created a climate that mysticism mm. was being pushed out. And when we now talk about the word mystic, we think about things which are sort of vague and, and mm. not very clear, etc. But if you actually go back to the literature of the mystics in the Middle Ages, they always, uh, I often like to say, they always talk about the seven towers of this and twelve rooms in, in that <laughs> building, etc. They were the most quantitative people of their time and yeah. they attracted the best minds of their time. So uh, if, we took, if we look uh, over a period of a few thousand years rather than a few hundred years, uh, every uh, country and every culture has had both the inquisitive, uh, uh, inquisitive tendency to analyze nature mm. as well as our own mind. Yes. <coughs> And, and what would you say in terms of uh, time, time and space, um, in terms of what quantum physics and kind of the Big Bang or mm -hmm. Einstein and relativity, anything that is kind of would be helpful for us in terms of time that could be said in, in three minutes? <laughs> Look, ask these very simple questions, you see. <laughs> I will talk him about the 12th Bodhisattva level of enlightenment after this uh, speech. <laughs> well, I think the, the really nice, uh, nice aspect of both relativity theory and quantum mechanics is that, uh, as I said in the beginning already, that it has brought back a sense of wonder and mm. a sense of, of magic, really, mm. in uh, our appreciation of the nature of reality, mm. uh, of the material nature of reality. Um, we, 
we started around 1600 by really simplifying things. And it was amazing that we could do that. That <laughs> Galileo was dropping some balls, did some very simple <laughs> experiments, and he had this vision that if you make things really simple and you analyze the motion of some simple objects, that you can step by step uh, unravel the, um, the, the riddles of uh, material reality. Mm. And by golly, it worked, very surprisingly. <laughs> uh, within one century, you had Newton, and then mm. things uh, became uh, more precise. You got electromagnetism. Uh, you got uh, theories of gravity being even more refined by Einstein. And then quantum mechanics came, which showed that everything was really not that simple, and that you could not Mm -hmm. uh, start with a classical space and time like a, a billiard ball type of stage and simple billiard ball players, but that uh, there is entanglement and things are, uh, objects are not just isolated objects. Objects are what they are depending on how you measure them. Mm -hmm. So to say it in a very simple way, uh, science is empirical and empirical means based on experience. Mm -hmm. And every experience, whether it is a um, sensory experience or a motor experience, whether I see a glass mm. or I do something and lift or drink from a glass, in all cases, normally we have a subject and an object and an interaction. Mm. And what science did 400 years ago is to study only objects, not right. interactions, not subjects. If different right. people in different ways handle the same object, whatever is similar between their experience, that is the, uh, the um, uh, property of the object. That was very, very radical and very naive. Uh, there were other cultures uh, in India and China uh, for thousands of years before 1600. And the wise people in those cultures had realized that this would be a ridiculous thing to do, hmm. to, to separate the objects from the rest that the world is much more um, integrated, that the world mo is much more unified. But somehow the uh, Europeans were naive enough, and it's a very, there are several theories why that is, that's a whole separate <laughs> evening we can talk about, okay. but they were naive enough to try and isolate the object part. And, and they really got very far. They mm. got a very deep understanding of the objectifiable part of nature. Mm. But whenever you do something, if you go deep enough, you run into the limits and you discover something new. Mm. That is the beauty of really going into something and really keep going, whatever it is. Even if you have a wrong idea, if you go far enough and you're honest and you persist, you see more about reality because it's the, the one reality mm. we live in. Mm. Scientific, spirituality, spiritually, contemplative. Mm. So, um, this whole chase of uh, this chasing of objects for 300 years from 1600 to 1925 mm. suddenly opened a new door of quantum mechanics where the interaction and the object were entangled. You cannot explain the results of quantum mechanics by positing that each object has an internal structure which can be measured by an objective measurement. Uh, that sort of model would be called a model of hidden variables. Uh, imagine that each object has some uh, properties, some states inside, which cannot be measured, that they found out very, uh, very, uh, very, easy, very early on. But maybe there are hidden variables inside each object. Fifty years after the invention of quantum mechanics, um, John Bell uh, uh, discovered that the mathematical theory of quantum mechanics can be used to prove that there are no hidden variables. Not only are the variables uh, of reality hidden in the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, that was discovered in 1925, but 50 years later, half a century later, it was discovered that we can prove that there are no hidden variables, that any set of variables you might guess might be there would be not compatible with the measurements. Hmm. In other words, if uh, two quantum states are entangled, two particles are entangled with each other and, be, and they are <coughs> being measured at very different places, the moment that this is measured, it influences the uh, type of correlations you can measure there. You cannot send signals. There is no causal relation. That would be 
very strange. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that would uh, not be compatible with our classical everyday experience. But the influence of the correlations, uh, if you push it, uh, posit it uh, classically, it has to go much faster than the speed of light. So right. there are all kinds of things which break down. And the bottom line, the way I would interpret it, uh, is to say, in the, this, in the invention of quantum mechanics, we realize that between subject, interaction, and object, uh, interaction and object are entangled. And I think it will be only a matter of time before subject and interaction and object all will be seen to be given together. Like all the great wisdom traditions have told us all along, mm. that the notion of a self is just an artificial pulling out of reality, just as the notion of an object is an artificial pulling out of the tapestry of reality. But you can do that to some extent. You can get very mm. far, and then uh, if you continue, uh, reality will show you that where the limits are and how you can go back to a more integrated way. So I think this particular decade uh, is the time that the study of the object and mm. the study of the subject are forced to come together, whether we want it or not. Yeah. Uh, the rapid progress of neuroscience, which tells us, which is so connected to who we think we are, and the rapid progress of AI and machine learning, artificial subjects, we are now creating artificial subjects, <coughs> this finally makes science completely empirical. Empirical not only one third empirical on the level of objects, but also on the level of subjects and interactions. Yeah. So whether we want it or not, we will become colleagues at the mm. end of this decade. <laughs> <laughs> so we better prepare. We might as well start now. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, yes. Yeah, so they, they, certainly the empiricism, I think, is kind of some of the radical nature of contemplative uh, practitioners uh, <clears throat> who you know, would, would be empirical even if they were in their, um, in their religious context where they were learning, you should, because of this, this means this. But the real contemplatives that were kind of pioneers uh, would just look at it and say, well, what's true and what's real and do we need that mm -hmm. hypothesis of the religious uh, assumption? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly one of the famous quotes of the Dalai Lama in his interesting dialogue with science, as many of you may know, um, is a scientist said, well, you know, you have this whole contemplative inner science. Uh, what if... Uh, we proved that some of your assumptions were, were wrong about what you found. And he looked at the person and said, well, then we change our beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> and so that kind of uh, possibility of really uh, doing subject science <laughs> that then connects to object and subject science. And certainly within neuroscience, um, <clears throat> what they're finding now as they're looking within the brain mm -hmm. is that um, there's a symphony, but no conductor can be found. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there isn't a little mini-me in there pulling levers, and there are parts of ourselves kind of functionally helping, but the sense of being, which you actually have less suffering, and you actually more optimally function is in what m probably the closest thing in science is called a flow state. So a flow state, or athletes talk about being in the zone, or musicians, um, <clears throat> has been studied by a, a, a scientist called Csikszent Mihai, and, uh, and the flow state um, is, a, is a way of being optimally functioning where you don't refer to thinking about thinking. That you've done uh, 10,000 hours of whatever you're good at, whether it's art or science or rock climbing or uh, sports or knitting or <laughs> anything, and you enter into this uh, timeless now where you're completely aware of your body, everyone else. It seems like time kind of slows down or one person, one of my students said, it's like time is soft. 
there's a feeling that there's an interconnection with everyone and everything. I don't know if you can kind of have an experience of some time or activity. In fact, most people, I think, who do activities for pleasure, whatever, think about what you do for pleasure, whether it's you know, working out or walking, or you probably enter the flow state as what you probably think of as kind of a symptom or an after effect of what you're doing, but it's probably why you're doing it. Does that make sense? Anyone have a sense of that? That whatever you do for fun or your hobby or your leisure activity, fishing or um, whatever, whatever it might be, uh, running, you get in the zone. So the flow state, the, you feel like there isn't an ego center. You're not referencing thought. Time slows down. You feel an interconnection with everyone and everything. You feel like you're optimally functioning without uh, secondary uh, worry or judgment, as you, as you mentioned before. There's, you're not in the judge. The judge is gone. You trust. You're in your, almost like your heart mind. You're, you're living from this level of interconnection and um, trust. And from here, this is an optimal way of functioning. So my th theory, since we're using theory, my theory, I always think of Monty Python when I say, my theory mm -hmm. is that the brontosaurus is very, 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 very thin at one end, very, very thick in the middle, <laughs> and very, very thin at the other end. That's my theory. <laughs> yes, but Dr. Havisham, that's, that's, everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's my theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so, so, so my, my, the, my theory is that, that we've all done 10,000 hours of walking, language, talking, relating to other people, whatever work you do. You have all those tasks, functional tasks, as an adult. You've trained your functional 10,000 hours of life tasks. Now, if you shift into the now, the awareness that's embodied in this timeless awake presence, you'll actually be out of the judge. You'll be in this interconnected feeling with everyone else that you don't feel is judged, and you feel um, a kind of natural rising of compassion and well-being, and you'll be optimally functioning. You'll actually be able to respond rather than react. So this, you know, so one of the doors is the now into this. The, the main really um, quality is, is the different type of awareness rather than attention or mental um, judgment and self-referencing, is getting out of that into this kind of awareness-based knowing that's embodied and open-hearted. And that's, that kind of brings you into the now. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> See, this doesn't help as a beginning of a collaboration, but <laughs> yes. uh, I think what we are going to do, and we may as well start now, yeah. is to have uh, a dialogue between science and contemplation about yeah. these topics, yes. but not by making a bridge not by saying here is science and here is uh, yeah. contemplation and here is a gap. Now we're building a bridge. Uh, it would be tempting to do that, mm. to wine and dine and to um, give a talk about um, uh, the Big Bang mm. uh, starting with light <laughs> and Genesis starting with light and being very polite and then nodding to each other. Uh, these things can be done and they are fun for a while, but. The much more interesting thing is to go down into the gap, to go down into the canyon and to look at the roots of science and the roots of contemplation, mm. starting with the suspension mm. of judgment mm. and starting with the empirical method, like where do the uh, religious, contemplative, contemplative, spiritual stories come from? Uh, they, there are traditions, there are lineages, but there were uh, radical types mm. who 
who went uh, against the stream of their time, who started these lineages yeah. uh, in science as well as in contemplation. So that is how we have to begin to see where do we come from and how can we compare mm. the roots. And the problem here is that uh, science is much more limited than contemplation. It has focused on a limited subset mm -hmm. of material, measurable, objective things. But the wonderful thing about science is that it is completely shared by any, anyone on the planet and mm. anybody can do an experiment mm. and check. The wonderful thing about contemplation is that in a way it is more deep and more, uh, more encompassing everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have not even begun to get the cultural sharing and integration. I think that will take a few hundred years. Yeah. Uh, in mm -hmm. many ways, Buddhism may very well be closest to science in being more abstract-minded mm -hmm. and theoretical-minded, besides being very deeply uh, experiential too. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, for me, once I got a sense of uh, some training in Zen Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism and other forms of Buddhism, then I began to recognize uh, the core experiences for so far in my own modest way, uh, I began to get access to that. I began to recognize it uh, in, the, in medieval Christianity when I started mm -hmm. reading uh, about it, in Sufism, mm -hmm. uh, Hinduism, mm -hmm. uh, Taoism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the time you get a familiarity, you recognize that. Yeah. But um, to start a dialogue between science and contemplation, I think we probably have to start at least at the same time, maybe even earlier, mm -hmm. between the great experiential mm -hmm. contemplative traditions mm -hmm. to get a little bit of a, a shared vocabulary. And that should be easy. If you let the priests and the, mul and the mullahs and all the, the uh, political figures talk with each other, then yeah. you start wars. <laughs> but if you bring contemplatives together, they will bow to each other and recognize each other's accomplishment, even without talking. Yeah. So that should be the easy part. Yes. So um, that, I think, is the, is the program to look at. And in science, uh, you don't have that. If you, ha if you do physics, and if you solve a simple problem in mechanics, you can either, either choose a Lagrangian uh, uh, or a Hamiltonian framework. Let's forget about what it means. But the, it would be inconceivable that you have an, a Lagrangian church and a Hamiltonian church and that people start arguing with each other or people start killing each other. That would be completely inconceivable. So I'm looking forward to the time that um, the much deeper contemplative tradition yeah. has learned from the uh, new kids on the block, from the physicist, yeah. to integrate their different uh, approaches rather than yes. fight about it. Yes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> a funny little story is about at a big inter-spiritual, inter-religious conference in India that I went to when I was studying there, um, thousands of people, a lot of big name people in all these talks. For So by the second day, I just kind of was sitting in the back and I was like, you know, kind of everyone's being polite and just talking about kind of the religious aspects. I walk out into the courtyard and kind of, all of a sudden I see like there's two or three other people there, and then there's four or five, and then we all get together. Mm -hmm. And the, these people became like my best friends. Mm -hmm. And they were all like the contemplative people who had kind of burned out at the same time on the, <laughs> <laughs> and all kind of went out for a break and needed a little air. And you know, we're, we're also from, but interestingly, one Sufi, one mm -hmm. uh, Kabbalist, one, you know, one, uh, Hindu yogi, one you know more Buddhist, and mm -hmm. but it was a, a you know a great uh, meeting. Um, <clears throat> so you know so this the sense of the now as being held by that we're held in time, psychological time, we're held in um, clock time, and that the dualistic mind, the identi identification that's created with this little managing system uh, keeps orienting uh, and almost creates this feeling of a little uh, identification, almost like it's an entity in your head behind your eyes looking out, right? Like, what's going on? What am I going to do? And it almost co-ops your body's uh, survival program, um, which is supposed to you know, watch out for 
cars when you cross the street and is supposed to remember to you know, plan, you know, get some food at the grocery store so you'll have enough in the refrigerator when you get home late at night and you won't have not planned for the future. And so it has to problem solve. But when this sense of not being in the flow creates this little mini me, this, uh, it creates a kind of what in Buddhism suffering is often defined <coughs> as perpetual dissatisfaction. Anyone identify with that? <laughs> yeah, we have a few. So that perfect, perpetual dissatisfaction is really that little judge or that problem solver on the level of identity. So, you know, there's definitely issues and problems and stuff to be dealt with on the relative level. But there's the secondary, who am I, what am I going to do, what am I going to get to satisfy me as a little thought-based loop, looping pattern that keeps trying to get something in time to satisfy it, but there's nothing for it to eat. There's nothing for it to satisfy because it's made of thought. And it thinks it's uh, a real being. It's a real person in there. So when that problem solver or that judge, judging part relaxes, you can almost start to feel the awareness and the nowness. Yeah? So just simply try this simple inquiry and look with awareness. So no big deal. You don't have to close your eyes or anything. Just simply ask yourself this question and then look with awareness. What's here now when there's no problem to solve? So just not looking up to thought, not looking to the past, not anticipating one moment into the future, just dropping, opening, feeling with awareness, what's this that's here, alert, and noticing thoughts, feelings, and sensations coming and going. What's here? What's this like? So just say a quality or phrase out loud. Anyone? Peace. Peace. Space. Space. Nothing. Nothing. Everything. 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 Me. Me. Quiet. Quiet. Contentment. Contentment. Whole. Whole. Ah. Why? Why? Chair. Chair. <laughs> yeah, so just noticing the quality of awareness, not what you're aware of, but the feeling of what's aware. And the feeling of time and thoughts and change just being allowed to happen without needing to <clears throat> get on the train of thought and just feel what's the feeling of now of awareness of being as moments come and go Anyone else? Another quality or phrase? What's here? Rest. 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 Breath. Tickle. Tickle. Toward what end? Toward what end? Now. <laughs> so just not what you're aware of, but what is the awareness <clears throat> like? What is the nowness, the all at onceness? Just that turning of awareness to itself, rather than what you're aware of, the breath, what is that awareness that's spacious and pervasive, interconnected, and all at once, nowness, 
in which time, moments coming and going. Anyone? What do you notice? What's here? What's this like? Here. Alive. Knowingness. Knowingness itself. Beautiful. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's... Uh, so, shall we... Uh, May I do one too? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> if this is the beginning of a collaboration. Yes, please. Let me do something a little bit similar, but then yeah. starting with science. Good. So, imagine that you are a hard-nosed scientist, and this was all a nice game, but now you go back to reality, and there is space and time, there is matter and energy, and that's all there is. Yeah? Okay, okay. hold on. Imagine. <laughs> so, you look around, and I see a piece of matter, my body, piece of matter, my brain, piece of matter. And then what? Well, the first step is to realize that even if you are a hard-nosed scientist, then you realize that your awareness, your experience, comes as an emergent property out of your brain. So if I feel and see and am in touch with a piece of matter like this chair, I cannot put a chair in my mind. I cannot put uh, the molecules of the chair in the emergent properties of my brain. Those are different concepts. Every hard-nosed scientist will agree with that. So what I consider to be matter <coughs> is really my experience. So let us switch from matter to experience. Mm. Now once you have experience, within the field of experience, within this emergent field coming out of the workings of the brain, within my field of experience, there is a subject and an object. Uh, a baby has to learn, uh, spend quite a few months to figure out what is the difference between self and other. So in the experience of a baby and a beginning infant, uh, there is a self part and an other part and they have to be polarized and being taken apart. Mm. I'm still talking like a hard-nosed scientist. Mm. And then uh, we realize, if we go back to that, that even for us adults, the fact that this is me and this is something else, subject and object are emerging properties out of the field of experience. Mm. So what is really the essence of experience? It is the appearance of the self and the appearance of the others. Mm -hmm. So now we are in a third, st a third stage of deeper honesty. What we consider normally as matter is more directly uh, experience, and the experience is really most empirically given as appearance, the appearance of subject and object, and we assign the experience to the subject and we call uh, the world, uh, world of matter. So if we go from matter to experience to appearance, then what can we say about appearance? And now here I am mm -hmm. uh, crossing mm. over in your mm. territory. Come on over. If we look at everything as appearance, the only thing we really know is that it is here. Nobody can, deny, can, nobody can deny that something appears. Mm. Everything else could be an illusion. It could be the past, the future could be an illusion. Everything could be illusionary or maybe not even there, even less than an illusion. But the appearance of the illusion is what appears here. So the one thing we really can be sure of, each of us, specifically, empirically, is the presence of appearance. So if you now spend a moment to focus on the presence of appearance, letting go of anything else, which, letting go of all the stories around what appears, if you can just sit with the presence of appearance for half a minute maybe, And part of the presence of appearance is the clock, which 
Tim told us yes. to watch, and we are at the very end. It's uh, what was given to us, so I think we now have to... The time is now.